a small setting because I feel like we're family. And you don't have to feel like, you know, it's just like we're just here. We're just having a great conversation. And uh, we all know that we live in a different world, right? We live in a different world. I was, I was born in 1981, and Coach Martha looked at me like, well, you a baby. But uh, theoretically, I am. And funny story, I jumped in the car with Coach Reeves yesterday. He said, pardon me, I'm playing my 1960s music. I say, no, leave it. <laughs> leave it because that's good music, right? So in order for us to really deeply connect with this generation of kids that we have, we must first seek understanding and why they actually act and perform the way that they do. So let's go down the lane of uh, understanding, okay? Just just look at the time warp here, the 1970s and the 1980s, right? Look at these shows. Look what, what, look what was happening during these times, right? Remember when you met the young lady? Or well, maybe you don't want to remember. When you met the young lady and you had to remember her telephone number? You had to write it down or try to remember it. Like, we live in a different world now. Now you can, you can text it or whatever it may be. You have CDs and tapes. This thing right here. It used to be full of like CDs from your mom. Say, go get me that CD. Then you gotta go open up all these, go find those in alphabetical order, right? Visiting unannounced. You can't do that now. You go to somebody's house without without <laughs> without invitation, it may be a problem. Now, disco and punk rock, like my dad, old military guy, he used to be out there jumping rope, hitting that heavy bag, and everybody's playing. I'm like, what in the world is this, right? But hip hop. The hip it, the hip it, the hip, hip pop, you don't. Rabbit to life. That came in. That was, that was kind of like the introduction to hip hop, right? Then the Beastie Boys. Oh, come on, man. You can't live without them. But think about the shows we used to watch, right? Think about the Threes Company, the Chips, the Dukes of Hazard. Woo, the Dukes of Hazard. You love the Dukes of Hazard, but I'm not going to tell you why you love the Dukes of Hazard. You should love the Dukes of Hazard. The Cosby <laughs> Show, the Fresh Friends, the Heat of the Night, Full House, the Jetsons. Jackson 5 and Marvin Gaye, but these are all the things that I was raised on in the 1980s. And so you think about it, you think about these TV shows, say like uh, The Fresh Prince, or you say um, The Jeffersons, or you say The Cosby Show, these things was built around family and love and helping each other out and working. And Dad set a great example, and Mom taking care of the house, she's working, aunts and uncles coming over to the house, Granny was alive. It was just a different world. Then when we all, what we live in now is completely different what this, what, what this is right now, what this was, right? But we miss these days. Now, those are the days when you brought your report card home and everybody had to see it. Auntie wanted to see it, the next door neighbor wanted to see it, and let it be or CB on that report card. You may get whipped five times before you get back home, right? It was just different. Now, check this out. All, I'm gonna tell you this right now. You could not tell me I went MC Hammer. I went and got the pants. I had the gold ones. I had the silver ones. They were baggy. I had a good time. But like, these were the days, right? These were the days. This was the foundation of a lot of us, right? Of a lot of us. But as we're starting to see, these days are gone. They're gone. And us in our positions, we're like, why are they acting like this? Why don't they understand what I'm trying to say? Why do they think I'm being hard on them? because they were raised completely different than how we were. And they, lived in, they live in a completely different society. And I'm not even saying that they're wrong, it's just what it is. Now, here it is. This is when the shift happens, 1990s, okay? I'm a radio head guy, I love radio head. Now I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you my all time favorite artists, right? It's two of them. Miss Whitney Houston, I want to dance with somebody and I want to feel the heat with somebody. Come on now, come on now. DMX is my guy, and Nirvana, I was listening to Nirvana yesterday. Now, you can't go, home with, you can't go wrong with a little Californication as well. But what I'm getting to, guys, and, I, and I'm, I'm gonna bring this whole thing together in a little bit here because the shift happened. Near the late 90s, 2000s. There were no more CD cassettes, there were no more CDs, it turned into iPods, MP3s, and then hip hop blew up. It came into a big global thing, right? And the music we used to listen to talked about love, talked about taking care of it. That don't sell anymore. We know it sells now. You gotta be talking about drugs, you gotta be talking about money, you gotta be talking about women. 
and not in the best way at that. It's, 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 it's so bad now. Even the women are talking worse than the dudes. And I listen to some of these songs. I'm like, what? Did she just say that? And my daughter back in the back, yes, yeah, she did. No, uh, 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 uh. Change this right now, right? But it's just a different world with social media, MySpace, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And then even the Nintendo games, the most violent game that we had back then was Duck, uh, duck Hunt. And mama said, you got to put that gun down. We don't play with guns. And my mom was a police officer, like 17. The only gun in this house is mine. But I'm back there shooting that duck. Boop, 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 boop. But now they got Call of Duty where they actually, you can actually work on killing somebody or breaking into somewhere and doing things. And so everything is just so virtual now. So they live in a criminal world without having to really be a criminal. But it's actually teaching them how to do this stuff, right? And then reality television, where some, some of the stuff is just being um, idolized for no apparent reason. Like, you can get a deal just for being cute these days. You don't have to, even have to be talented anymore. So what in the world does this have to do with anything? Just look at the music. I like these artists, but I actually listen to what they're saying. Some of these guys sold the most records out of anybody in the last two or three years, right? But you got YouTube, you got PlayStation, you got Twitter. But these are the influences of our culture right now. And I'm missing a lot of them, right? I'm missing a lot of them. But what I'm getting to is this. All because we was raised a certain way and listened to a certain type of music and culturally it was different. This is the culture that they're raised in. And we can't turn back the hands of time. So when I talk about this connectivity, this is what I do, right? This is what I do. I call the guys into the office. Pull up your favorite song, and they pull it up. But I don't just pull it up. I pull it up with lyrics, and it ain't the clean version. I say, now, you're singing this song, but un do you understand what this is really saying? Do you understand this message? And is this something that you want to represent yourself out in the community? Do this, is this something you want your kids to go out in the community and actually do these type of things. And if you're, if these are your role models, and they will say they're not, but whatever it is, that's what they're putting out there, is this how you want to live your life? And where do you think this is going to lead you? So I let them listen to this music, but it's only the clean version. But they know where I stand. They know where I stand. I know where they stand. But this is where it comes together. Every day during the week, oh, we got a different theme. On Monday, we'll mix it up a little bit, OK? They're going to get some of mine's, we'll get some of theirs. On Tuesday, we ain't going theirs. Mariah's coming on, <laughs> Whitney's coming on. On Wednesday, we'll mix it up a little bit more. But on Friday, it's heavy metal and we getting out. That's why I love it. Friday, I'm not going to say what, what Friday is, but Friday is one of those very, 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 very aggressive things. And all we listen to is heavy metal the whole time. So. What, what, we, what we try to do, and then I know you guys understand it too, is that I work on the West Coast and some of those guys, it's just different, it's just different, it's just different culture out there, right? And they're very into the interpersonal relationship out there, how much you care and all that stuff. But when I was growing up, I didn't care how much you care, that's what you said, dude, that's what I'm gonna do, that was just the end of it, right? But when you're dealing with a certain type of kid that may live maybe from Compton, he may be from Watts, he may be from Inglewood, he may be from, uh, the valley, just completely different people from different walks of life. And some some guys, you, you can't say what's up, cuz, and you can't say what's up, brother. You gotta get ready to fight. And you just saying hello, right? And then they, a lot of those guys in general, just kids in general, they're already on, in, in a defense mode once they meet you because they have so many layers that you just gotta pull back. So the one thing that I've done that I've always proud of my, what you see is what you always got. So they know exactly who I am. If any insecurities I may have, they know my kids, they know how I roll every single day. But the thing about it, they know it's gonna be that way every day. It's never gonna change. You're just gonna be consistent with it. So, since, since we know uh, we live in a different world and things are different, now we just gotta provide the tools. Now I work, in my opinion, I think I work for one of the smartest people in the world, Coach Chip Kelly. Um, he, he's different. He's different as different you can get. Okay, and everybody knows him from Oregon and the fast-paced offense and the sports science. Like, trust me, when it comes to sports science, he is the sports science guy. 
and we sit there and we have lengthy conversations about the GPS, about training. He understands training probably better than a lot of people in here. Like he's just how he is. Like he's fully involved in it. But the biggest thing is just meeting them where they are. And I always say you want to build a want to build a bridge and not a fence, right? Because the better the relationship with these guys, and they understand us and we understand them, even though we probably don't agree with what they're saying and what they're doing, if we have some type of foundational uh, idea of where those behaviors stem from, then we got an idea of how to move forward with it. Lead with love and show compassion. Now, this is the deal. That don't mean be soft at all, right? <laughs> Cause love, sometimes love hurts. And that compassion, sometimes you gotta tell you gotta tell them the truth, but you gotta tell them the truth, the truth with compassion. And sometimes they mix your passion with compassion, right? But the former IDP, so every player on our team, they have to do one of these. So their personal goals, um, but then they gotta have action items. Okay, you say you wanna do this, how are you gonna do it? And you have to list out all the steps of how you wanna do this. So if I wanna go to the NFL, which all the guys think they're going in, and they're not, right? Okay, how are you gonna do this? I'm gonna show up the weights every day, I'm gonna show up the breakfast every day, I'm not gonna show up dehydrated. Um, my body my body weights are gonna be good, I'm gonna be on time, blah, 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 blah. Okay, now, everybody's excited about those things the first two to three weeks of training, right? But by week four, it's not, it's not as popular to continue to do that. So what we do every three to four weeks, and the position coaches and the head coach, they're gonna meet with somebody every single week regarding those IDPs and how are you doing on this? How are you doing in class? Well, I saw you miss class two days ago. That does not match up to what you put on here, what you said your goals were, right? You said you wanted to be a 3.2. How are you going to be a 3.2? You can't go to tutoring, you're not going to class, and you miss your meeting. So those type of things, it brings everything back home. That way they can get focused back on the mission, okay? Clarity to overall, uh, their overall mission. Not only their personal mission, but the mission of the program, right? And we always say we want to graduate our players, okay? We all know that UCLA is a highly academic institution and it's a tough institution. I go check classes and some of those classes I'm sitting in, I was sitting in oceanography for like three minutes. I'm like, I have no business in this class, right? But it's, it's a tough school. It's a tough institution, but um, it is what it is. They decided to go there. Part of them said they want to go there because it was a highly academic institution. So take your butt to class. I don't always say but, but I respect everybody. I'm gonna say but right now. Okay, um, <laughs> simplify everything. So, and that's the training uh, training sessions and the schedule. So when I say simplify things, like I'm a lot like you, uh, Coach Joy, a lot of all of us, we don't do a lot of stuff. We keep it as simple as possible. We front squat, we back squat, we deadlift, we do plyo, we do bent drops, we tumble a lot, right? We do cartwheels, uh, we do combatives. Um, we do everything, but what we do, I don't try to go so outlandish with it, but the guy's got to think about it anymore. Because the, the demands of the sport is, is hard enough. Then they have school. When they come in the weight room, they know exactly what they need to do, how it needs to be done. And they've done it so many times that they don't even have to think about it anymore. So when I say simplify it, so their rhythm, their rhythm comes like this. They come in the weight room, these are your cards. And I have five guys. I'm, what, actually, you know what? I think I got you, Coach Moffitt. I think I got you. I'm gonna have 18 guys this summer. That's not on camera. Oh, wow. I'm gonna have 18 guys. 18 guys this summer. 18 guys this summer. But, um, but what we do is, each one of those guys, they have a program and they explain it, whether it's the skill guys, the big skill, big guys, quarterbacks, any guys. And we go, through, we go through that form every single day, but after like week two, I don't even go through it anymore. The players, are, I mean, I'm sorry, the coaches don't even go through it anymore. I had the quarterback say, hey, fuck quarterbacks, this is what we got. I got the D-line and say, hey, D-line, this is what we got. And they understand everything. And at the most, it's probably five exercises on there. Now, you may throw some supersets in there, but everything is simple. Everything is fast. But the intensities are high at times and the volumes are high at times. Depends on what day we're in. Okay. Does that make sense? Good. Okay, now, set a consistent schedule. And I'm going to show you that, guys that in a little bit. Then edit your life. So this is something I got from uh, Coach Kelly. And he always talks about editing your life, editing your life. What are the things outside of ball that's taking your attention away? Whether it's ball and school. 
whether it's, it's, your, it's your social life, whether it's something going on at home, whatever it may be, we have to try to minimize all distractions. He always says we're going to be the most prepared and least distracted team in America. We're going to be the most prepared and least distracted team in America. But it all comes from everybody in the building kind of editing their life. And I said our schedule is set up for that. Okay, and then hold yourself accountable, which is which is us, and then be the example. And I love what Coach Mark said because he's been coaching over 37 years, and I worked for Coach Reed every single day. It was a, it was a smile. It was a, it was a smile, but it was a smile with intensity. Like, yeah, I'm smiling, but I'm really not laughing. It's smiling, but it's kind of one of those that we all have as coaches. But I really feel like, and I talk about this in our spirit part of it. I really feel like we really just set the tone, not just for our football team. I really feel like we set the tone for our athletic department and not the university. Because we have a hundred something guys and th those hundred something guys, they got friends that are not football players, right? They may be basketball players, soccer players, or just regular students and they have influence over them as well. And if you think one time that they're not going back talking to their friends, talking about, <laughs> oh, wait, today was one of the days. But what did coach talk about today? talked about this discipline and doing this and doing this and so we have a bigger effect than we really think we do like one for every one you influence like five or six people so we just got to be mindful of that and then man last but very least and I'm pretty sure we all know this sometimes you just got to get out the way when them boys are rolling and they know what they're doing if you've already explained that, that drill just let them go let them compete don't overcoach them don't make them think no more let them go and we'll fix that later but when they're competing, let them compete, as long as we're not overdoing it, right? But ones like Coach George say, if they line up on that line and I look beside you, I'm not running that lap today. I'm telling you that right now. You might as well tighten your shoes up tighter. Like, that's how you know you want that. But again, that's, we're going to talk about that later. That's the spirit of the team. That's the spirit of the team. So I'm trying to make this fast, Coach. I, now the body. Now here it is. This is the part I've been chewing on. I've been chewing on. I've been chewing on. I've been chewing on, man. And um, this is the part, even in my own personal life, I've gotten better, okay? You got to start with that sleep. That body is the temple, okay? The body, this is what I put. This is me. This is me. This is a philosopher again, okay? And I don't know if it makes sense to you, but it makes sense to me, okay? The body is the physical manifestation of one's thoughts, beliefs, ideas, perceptions of themselves. Oh, my God. I don't know if that's true, but that's how I feel, right? That's how I feel. But let me tell you how, this is how it's gonna go. So we're go we did a sleep study with our soccer team, right? And uh, they ended up winning the national championship last, last season. I thought it was great. They went down to North Carolina and beat North Carolina at North Carolina to win it. It was great, that's hard to do. But they did a sleep study for 10 weeks, right? And so what we found, and we got it from Stanford, right? We got it from, I would hate to admit that we stole anything from Stanford, but we did, right? Because they did it with various, various sports. But what we did uh, with the soccer team, we finished it with the football team. It's a 10 week study. And what we found is that um, across our athletic department, more particularly the, so the soccer team, they were only sleeping six hours a night, right? And they, we used the whoop dance, right? So we encouraged them to go eight to 10 hours a night of sleep on top of everything else, their nutrition, their training and everything else, right? But what we found was when it was doing the pro agility, whether it was doing their linear speed, whether it was doing the vertical jumps, everything jumped dramatically just off sleep. And I know other factors are in that, but sleep is probably one of the biggest factors when it comes to overall development and overall improvement in anything, okay? So yeah, we're talking about practice. Yeah, we're talking about practice and sleep, right? <laughs> we're talking about practice and sleep. And so, one thing that working with Coach Kelly, he's big into the circadian rhythm, okay? Who knows what that is, raise your hand. Okay, so a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't. And so um, i tell you how these things work. This is our circadian rhythm, but we call it the battle rhythm, okay? So this is our everyday, this does not change. So when I say our schedule, this is our schedule. It does not change all year. So there's no guessing. It simplifies the kid's life. They can edit their life around this. So we always say, we always say, prioritize everything around your sleep. So we always see um, whether, whether it's US, you know, UCLA, Oregon, whoever, right? Wherever Coach Kelly has been, they always talk about the fast office. They always talk about the efficiency. 
we run between our seven on seven and our uh, three on fours and our, and our team period, we run around 150 plays of practice, which is a lot. And that's, that's not teach periods, that's not walkthroughs. These are like full team reps, right? So this is, this is how this thing works. From six to eight is check-in, okay? So check-in is hydration testing, which is every day, right? Hydration testing, body weights, okay? And then we monitor your sleep and we document it all, okay? Now, the team meeting starts at 7.30, but everybody has to be dressed already. But let me, let me digress a little bit. I didn't wait the spring ball to start doing this. I started this in January. So we still had a team meeting, even though it wasn't, even though it wasn't spring ball, we still had a team meeting. It was just me leading the meeting and telling them exactly what the day's mission was, and then we showed Karate Kid the same scene every day. Wax on, wax off. The same two minute skit. It was every single day. And they got so used to seeing it, it was to the point where they all stood up and they started doing it. And it, it was great. It was great, but it was just the synchronization of the team. Okay, so after the check in, you got this team meeting at 7 30. Everybody's dressed, ready to go. And I let them pick out what we're wearing. They say, they say what are we going to wear? Coach, I said, what color socks you want to wear? They say, black. Okay, that's what we're going to wear. What color shorts? Black. Okay, we're going to wear black shorts. What color shirt? Black. Fine, it's up to you. Now, now that you guys have chosen this, this is what you're wearing every day. And so they showed up every day. And that, that way, when spring ball came and they was already dressed, they had already been doing it for two months already. So we didn't have to go back and do anything. Offensive, defensive meetings, training starts at 845. So coach doesn't call it practice. He doesn't call it practice at all. He calls it training because we're training for something. We're not practicing anything. We're training. And he always says, as everybody says, you always stoop to the level of your training, not to the level of your practicing. So you stoop to the level of your training. You don't rise to the occasion. Now from 845 to 1045, so this training, it could be on field training or it could be weight room training with myself. It's still training, right? Lunch is from 11 to 1. Position meetings is in the afternoon. So if, when you really look at the schedule, you're on campus where well, you're in an athletic uh, facility from 7 to roughly 11.30. Then you off, you out. You come back just for a walkthrough in the afternoon and dinner, okay? So any weight training we do, everything is done between eight and 11 o'clock. Nothing's gonna happen in the mornings, let me tell you why. Cause trust me, I asked about it. Say what? <laughs> no 6 a.m. runs. This blew my mind because since I've been in, oh, it's six o'clock, toes in the line, we gotta go. I asked about it. He said, okay, Keith. He said, you went to Syracuse, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, what time did you go to bed at night? I said, coach, sometimes 11.30, sometimes 12. He said, what time did you get up? Well, we had training at 6, so by the time I got up a few times, used the bathroom, right? I probably got up at 5. He said, what did you eat? I said, probably apple. Probably apple, probably some juice and some water. He said, well, the first thing is you're not getting enough sleep. I, he then, then he asked me, he said, uh, if I'm, if he said, Keith, if you're going to be honest with me, how nervous did you feel when you had to go train? I said, Coach, I was malnourished, but I just showed up because you said that's the time we need to be there. He said, if we're ever going to grow, because <clears throat> if we're ever going to grow, if we're ever going to get bigger, stronger, faster, more competent, understand, then we have to get enough sleep. So he's never going to start anything before 8 o'clock but the education piece, we have doctors coming in, you need to be to bed at this time, you need to wake up at this time, that way you check in at this time. And so we go by the circadian rhythm, so for Coach Kelly, how he sees it, is that you get this deep sleep. Now we all know in the first hour, hour and a half, two hours, you're gonna get the most benefit of the HGH, right? So we wanna be able to get that every single night. So whatever time you go into bed, you wanna keep that as consistent as possible. I'm an 8.30 guy. So when Coach Reed said dinner at 8 o'clock, I'm like, woo wee I'm already past that, right? But you want to be as consistent as you can, right? Because of the circadian rhythm, what happens is you got thousands of genes within your body to get used to a certain time of the day to be performing certain types of activities. And it takes time. It takes time. Now, once you break that for a day or two, you're already off. Like me, I've been in three time zones in two days. So I'm already off. But what happens is you lose your HGH levels of where you were, right? 
you use it, you lose your sleep, and you're not as uh, productive as you probably could have been prior to that. Now, if you continue those, there's tons of disadvantages of not about, about not getting sleep, obesity, ADHD, um, lack of lack of energy, wherever those things are, right? So we like to really perform here where the cortisol release is. So around this area right here, this is where we're training. When you when you have the highest amount of alertness, right? So from this 8:45 to like 11:30, this is where we're training. From here to here, we're in class. Then we come back for a walkthrough. By seven o'clock, the guys are out. So they have from seven to basically nine o'clock to do be a college kid, but we're expected for all our guys to get in that bed by nine o'clock. That way that next morning at six, when we ask you how many hours of sleep, you should be able to tell us eight or nine hours. Now, if you're getting six, if we because we because we get them. If the guys are getting six, we send them up with the sleep doctors and they go get evaluations and get everything they need to make sure that uh, they're not sick or whatever they may be. And that's an everyday deal. So, <clears throat> tips for sleep. First, you gotta understand the value of your sleep, right? Prioritize your day around sleep. So whatever the strenuous uh, things you have to do, I would always prefer to do them in the morning. Now, I understand because of class and head coach's preferences, things are different. You probably don't have the choice, but I'm just, I'm, I'm lucky, I'm blessed because Coach Kelly, I know we're gonna do everything in the morning, right? Um, this was on the flash drive, I had corrected this, but don't charge it to my heart, all right? <laughs> develop, develop an exercise program, obviously. And this is just for general people, right? Um, consistent meal times. And you can, I would even go deeper than that. I would have consistent meals. Whatever you, whenever, whatever you find out works for you and it's on the health spectrum, if you can eat the same thing, then do it, right? Now, this is what I had to, well, sorry, develop a curfew uh, for your screens, for just for your telephone. So I follow the three, two, one, right? Does anybody, anybody know what the three, two, one is? So they say don't eat, any three, don't eat anything between um, three hours before you go to sleep. Don't drink anything two hours before you go to sleep, and then get off your screen an hour before you go to sleep because of the blue ray and all those different things. Now, the thing that's difficult about that, because I've been to schools where you train and you practice in the afternoon, is that you may get off the field at 5.30, 6 o'clock, then you gotta go eat. But the, the, the backside of that is one, you're gonna be going to bed really soon here, and then two, your core temperature is still gonna be high. So at all, you want to keep cool, so you want to be around 68 degrees. You want to have 68 degrees in your home, in your bed, uh, wherever you're going to sleep. So a lot of times when you practice in the afternoon, your core temperature is high. It takes a while to get that down. Um, meditate in the morning and sleep good at night. That's the, that's the three, two, one. And then develop a sleep ritual. Like for me, I'm a prayer guy, then I go to sleep, right? <laughs> I'm a prayer guy. But whatever your ritual is, then go ahead and get in that, get in that mode. Now, I just can't say stuff like this, right? Okay. I like to look at the grades, right? So it's been reported that Tom Brady goes to bed every night at 8.30, right? I don't know if it's a fact or not, but that's what's out there, right? That's what he's putting out there. LeBron likes to get 12, but this kind of blew my mind, right? But Roger Federer, he said, if I don't get 11 to 12 hours a day, it's not right. If I don't have that amount of sleep, I hurt myself. He even, he even went, he even went further than that. So when he traveled with his family, he went and got two different homes. I sleep in this one, you sleep in that one. <laughs> Just so I get, it's, it's wild. But you, everybody's not Roger Federer, right? Everybody can't do that. I can't even get two rooms. I can't even get a suite. So, uh, and then obviously, uh, Miss Adriana Hulk Huffington, she's the author of, uh, of Thrive. So she does tons of sleep studies and a lot of this information I got from her, so I want to give her her flowers. I like what she said, though. Getting enough sleep is like bringing an overnight cleaning crew to clear out the toxic waste proteins that accumulate between the brain cells during the day. Got to clean that stuff out, man. So, okay, this is my favorite part, man, because we've been talking about the spirit all day, and I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit, right? I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about what, what I do want to talk about is who we are is important, right? What Dick does is important, what Joy does is important. 
you know, what, 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 what uh, Coach Moffitt does it for. What every coach and what you do is important, but it's the spirit of how we do it, right? And I always say the spirit of the leader is the spirit of the bat because people are going to follow you, whether you like it or not, right? The spirit of the leader is the spirit of the pack. So I'm going to read through this. And I, can't, I made this up too, so you can quote it. I don't want any credit for it, but I'm a writer. I was a history major in college. All I did was write papers, so I'm kind of one of those guys, right? I'm really in my feelings sometimes, right? And so the spirit of unspoken language, as a leader of youth, we all have to, we have to be mindful of how we lead. I strongly encourage everyone, including myself, to lead through the spirit of love, excellence, and compassion, peace, and understanding. As leaders, we are thoroughly evaluated every second of the day by our players, coaches, and administrators. Most importantly, our immediate families, our sons, are learning how to be men, and our daughters are, learn, are looking for the ideal husband. And, I, and I, I really think about this, right? So think about it. Let's go back to the conversation we had earlier. In the 70s and the 80s, that were broken homes. It's it always been broken homes, right? But you always had uncle. You always had Coach Moffitt. You always had the, the, the sport coach, your middle school coach, your elementary school coach, your youth coaches, right? But a lot of those entities are gone now. And guess what? I know I know Bubba's nine, but you got another 105, 20-year-olds looking at you like, dang, I love Coach. I want to be like Coach. Russell Shepard is one of my favorite people in the world. Man, I love Coach Moffitt. He used to try to kill me, but I owe everything to that man. I wanted to fight him a couple of times. He pulled me in his office when I first got there, and he, he saved my life. But that's how this thing goes. But that's because of the spirit that you lead with, right? It's the unspoken words that Coach, Coach, Coach Reeves had when that density training was on that dog on screen. And them boys saw those 12 sets of two in 30 seconds. I was like, what in the world? And he's not me. I'm out there now. I'm out there. I'm loud. I'm doing <coughs> stuff sometimes. And all he was like this. <laughs> <laughs> and the clock was rolling. <laughs> he's looking at the clock the whole time because, you know, you got 10 seconds to go ahead and get your hand back on that bar. But it was the spirit of the leader. It was the spirit of the pack, man. People follow you, right? And I just wanted to, I personally wanted to sit on this, man, because I learned how to be a strength coach from my football coaches. Which sounds weird. I learned how to be a strength coach because I never wanted to be one. I wanted to go back to my high school in West Charlotte and be a high school football coach. And then this guy named Coach Ethan Reed called me and said, hey, we got an internship at Wake Forest. and you want? I said, you can't go right, I'll be there. But this is my high school coach, right? I think he's the best coach in the world, but I'm biased. His name is Coach Tom Knox. Coach Tom Knox is at Dutch Fork High School right now. He was at West Charlotte and that other school in Charlotte that everybody likes to talk about called Independence. I hate that school. There's nothing good about that school. <laughs> but this guy right here, you want to talk about the spirit of the man? how to show up on time, how to be the leader, how to be strong. You see those triceps? I think he do that on purpose because I think the defense is on the other side. There's probably a kid on the other side of him that was probably talking crazy to him that he wanted to show his tricep. But like, he operates like that. Like, if he called me today, I'd be scared. Crap. But anyway, that's my dude. Um, Coach Pasqualoni, you want to talk about, I hate to call anybody crazy, but you want to talk about that's on the verge? Coach Paul Tascaloni, 90 Syracuse, maniac, maniac. But he talks about being disciplined. He talks about being accountable. He talks about being professional. He talks about how to treat people, how not to treat people. And to this day, I still talk to Coach Tascaloni. It's not because he was just this great coach. It was just the spirit of the leader, right? But this dude right here, Coach Mike Shanahan, I've never met nobody like him. Ever. This short. I was surprised. I'm thinking I showed I showed to them. I'm like, man, where's Coach Shanahan up? Hey, Kiva, who are you? <laughs> but it was his presence. It was the spirit that he walked around with. He didn't play no games. He had great relationships with everybody. If you was wrong, he didn't care if you was if you was Jay Cutler. If you was Rock Smith, if you was Jake Plummer, if you was Taven Bell, it didn't matter who you were, you're going to get called out in that team meeting if you're wrong. And so when I talk about the spirit, man, it's like 
and Coach said it, and when you talk about coach to coach, I tell you what, there's no better relationship. If you can have dynamic relationships with your coaches, because your coaches have to be a vessel of you, right? They have to follow you. They have to believe in you. And if they make a mistake, and, I, and I've been there, I've been there. If they make a mistake, never embarrass your coach. Never embarrass your coach. Because at the same time, they have pride and ego too, and they're gonna make a mistake too. They may bark back, and I've had that happen too. And we, I've been like this with a coach before, like, no, 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 no. But I had to learn as a leader, if I do that, and this was years ago, if I do that, then the kids gonna feel like it's okay to be disrespectful to me too, right? But what I've learned through leadership, through continual leadership, is that when you set a great example and you keep a high standard and you're consistent, people want that even if they don't like it, including your staff. Be good to your staff because you chose them. <laughs> you chose them. Teach your staff. Nurture your staff. Lead with love and compassion and understanding. But, but, but push them. I'm almost like yourself, Coach Moffitt. I don't, I don't write the programs anymore. I, I know you do, but I don't. I'm saying I don't. Because my thing is this. If I really want to help you grow, you write it. And then you, then we all want to talk about it. And then you tell me why you're doing this. At this time of year, why is that value that way? Why is that intensity that way? And why, why is this exercise selection that way right now? And if you can tell me why and it makes sense and it fits into what our vision is for the program, then yeah, let's do it. So all of my assistant coaches, they write the program. You don't know why? Because if I'm gonna pay you, if we're gonna pay you, if Coach Kelly's gonna pay you, and I gotta write the program, why are you here? I might as well do it myself. That's how I see it. I might as well do it myself. Now, with that being said, before you guys bite my head off, <laughs> before you bite my head off, in the interviewing process, oh, we get through all that. Talk to me about what you believe. Don't worry about what I believe. Talk to me about what you believe. What's your background? How do you feel about Olympic lifting? How do you feel about kettlebell? How do you feel about tumbling? How do you, when, why, where, how? We get through all that. But by the time you by the time you get there, I'm gonna take over for the first block. Then after that, let's roll. But these are again communication. We talk every day. You seen our schedule? Look at this schedule. This is the best schedule in college football. Period. When we get done here, we have nothing as a staff. Nothing. We live in LA. So this is what I tell the guys. This is what you're gonna do. You're gonna go eat lunch with your wife. You're gonna pick your kids up from school and you're gonna go be a dad. So once we get done lifting, once we get done talking about that day, as far as training, whether it was practice and looking at the data, looking at the GPS stuff, at two, three o'clock, you're gone. I'm putting you out because this is what I believe and I could be wrong, but I've been married 15 years and the only reason I've been married for <coughs> 15 years is because my wife stayed with me, okay? But this is what I believe. You would never be a great coach. You would never be a great mentor to these young men if your household ain't in order. It's impossible. It's impossible. So I always tell the guys, the guys that I have the privilege to work with, three of them are married, you need to go home. And you need to go be a husband first. You need to go be a dad first. And then when it's time to come back here next tomorrow morning at six o'clock, we're gonna knock this out and we're gonna do it with tons of energy because I'm gonna show you how to do it. I'm gonna show you how to do it. Just follow me and you're gonna be just fine. But when it's, when it's time to be done, you're done, you're going home. And then I don't want them to get, okay, I, I'm not telling the whole story. I don't want them to get stuck in that traffic either. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that nice of a guy. I just don't want you to get stuck in that traffic. But I really just believe in taking care of the guys that, that, that we work with. You just have to, if you want them to do a really, really good job, right? One, you gotta pay them, that's the first thing. But it, it, you know, you got to make sure they get that time with their family because you got to be able to balance that thing, y'all. And I remember I called, um, I called Coach Moffitt. This was years ago. He said, Keith, I won't be there because I got to go see my son play baseball, probably. He said, Coach, you can come by, but I got to go. And I'm like, I learned something. That was a two minute conversation. I got to go see my son play baseball. I won't be there, but you can come. But I got to go. Enough said. 
So I learned that from you, right? I learned that from you. Coach said I had five minutes, that means I really got two. Okay? <laughs> so in <laughs> finishing this out, guys, um, I think the overall thing, the, the what to do, I think we got that, right? The how to do it, I think we got that too. But I really wanted to take a deep dive on how can we really build that bridge and not that fence that's already there. Because a lot of these guys or young ladies, they don't have anybody in their lives that look like them. And a lot of these guys and young ladies too, they was raised by mom or maybe even grandma. So nobody really ever told them no before, particularly the boys, because they big now. And they can intimidate. So the first time they hear the truth may come from Coach Victor, come from Coach Jordan, come from Coach Mark, it come from Coach Warren. Or come, it could be, but these relationships are so vital. So vital. That's why it's just so important, guys, that we just continue to educate. Because we only really got two jobs. We got two jobs. That's to educate and motivate. That's it. And it's a continual process. It never stops. Educate, motivate, educate, motivate. We always say guys don't do things for three reasons. Either they don't know, they aren't able to, or they don't care. If they don't know, that's my fault. If you don't know what you're doing, I put you in a bad position. That's my fault completely. If you weren't able to do it, guess what? That's my fault too, right? We probably over-recruited you. You made a mistake. But if you don't care, that's a whole nother issue. We gotta go back to motivating. We gotta go back to educating. And that's our only job, putting these kids in the right position to do exactly what they need to do so they could be successful, not only in the classroom, not only on the field, but in the classroom as well. And it really comes down to creating really, really good habits whether it's eating habits, sleeping habits, sleep habits, the things that they put in their body, and we always call it Operation 22. It's those 22 hours when they're not with us. But we have to equip them with those tools. So I made it. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. That's it.